Listen, if Big Mama love you so much, tell her to come to your house doing Hanukkah. Yeah, she, she, they, they never come to try to celebrate your holiday. Yeah, exactly. Big Mama's, Mama's not, has yeah, holiday. Yeah, yeah. Big Mama's not coming. On our feast days, we remember what it means to be joyful. Another chance to get together. Another chance to show some love. These days, every day I'm on a plantation, counting down the clock into the weekend. Test of my faith, I punch my way through this fight. We've been going left for so long, I finally do it right. Hey, shalom fam, I'm just happy to be here. So many feast days we celebrating all year. Truth music bumping all through my speakers, looking at a crowd full of righteous law keepers. I, congregation, the unity of brethren, fringes everywhere, man, it's feel like heaven. I know the Lord God, I love this holy convocation. Children in the spirit have a holy conversation. Sisters with the unleavened bread. The scriptures out, you know they gotta cover up their head. Most high in Christ's blessing, gotta show my bro respect. Fellowship and scripts coming out. To the east, just did a mission. Now I'm headed to a feast. Ten toes down when I'm stumping on the beast. Two turned up, made some mark say sheesh. Before I left the crib, had to send him to the east. Just did a mission. Now I'm headed to a feast. Ten toes down when I'm stumping on the beast. Two turned up, made some mark say sheesh. Two turned up, make the heaven say sheesh. Two turned up, make the heaven say sheesh. Two turned up, make the heaven say sheesh. Two turned up, two turned up. Yeah. I suggest you get your ass over here in the West Coast. Stop playing games, y'all. This is where it's at. The West Coast is the best coast. Stop playing games, y'all. So many great things that's going on here. So I, I was definitely uh, thankful to the Most High, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm thankful to the crew that uh, that really looked out for me and my family for us to come here and uh, to really enjoy this, and I'll never forget this. Christ bless you. Brothers, we push hard for the Lord, but it's not enough. We have an entire earth to conquer, and right now, I, the Black Rhino, call to the mighty warriors of Israel. I call to the lions of Judah, to the wolves of Benjamin, to the priests of Levi. I call to my tribesmen of the northern kingdom to unite, to fight the evil, and save the humble. We blitz Tijuana, Mexico in March.
Messiah is a savior and a conqueror. I'm going to show you and prove to you that the Israelites are black, were always black, always will be black. Is he Nathaniel? Yeah, he a prophet sent back to the earth, back to the earth. He sent you to wake up the people and tell them, come out of the church, come out of the church. He ready for war, as soon as they want to get out of the dirt, out of the dirt, hey. Shout out, why, shout out, why, shout out, why, toes down. Shout out, why, shout out, why, shout out, why, toes down. Got the juice, I ain't talking no we late, cause he's walking the light of a new day. I can't listen to nothing a few say, thank the Lord that he showed us a new way. Shout out, why, shout out, why, shout out, why, toes down. Shout out, why, shout out, why, shout out, why. Shalom, brother. Shalom, sister. Bishop Nathaniel here. You know what day it is. That's right. It is Shout Out Tuesday. It's Shout Out Tuesday. And you know how I love to read your letters of exhortation and donations of support. But before I do that, I often love to cover a little small glimpse into our history. So take a look at our history. Get your Bibles, pens, and notebooks. Get your snacks. Get your libations. Whatever you do when you watch Shout Out Tuesday, all right? So I'll come right back with my commentary on Bishop Destry Bell. Russian icons by Father Vladimir Ivanov. I'm going to show you the images of Christ and the apostles being black in Russia during the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. Picture 52, Descent of the Holy Ghost. Moscow Archaeology. Let's look at picture 52. There's Christ in the center with the crown on his head. And you have the 12 apostles. Let's start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And there's Christ in the center. What color are they? Black. They're all black. Black men. The Jews were always black, according to bibliography and the history. Uh, 63, the Apostle and Evangelist St. Matthew. Black. Miracle of the Great Martyr St. George and the Dragon. So St. George the Dragon Slayer. So you see the, mov the movies at, with white men slaying dragons. No. It was our ancestor. There's a, a young Leviathan at the bottom. That's what dragons were called in the Bible, Leviathans. And there's Christ giving him the Holy Spirit to go forth and win the battle.
black. What color are they? Black. The Holy Apostles Peter and Paul with scenes from their lives. Novgorod, Museum of Art History and Architecture. Black. Even look around the sides. The Ministry of Peter and Paul. They were always painted black. These are things uh, young black men and women don't learn in church or anywhere, except from the Israelites. That's when he's crucified one of them upside down. I believe this was Peter. Picture 19, Wisdom Hath Built Her House, Monastery of St. Cyril near Novograd, Moscow. What is this? Wisdom Hath Built Her House. What color are these Jews? Black men, black, wiz black women. Look at that. There's no mistake in this. Picture 18, Transfiguration of the Lord, Novograd, 15th century, that's the 1400s, Museum of Art, History, and Architecture. The three disciples, Peter, James, and John asleep. Okay, there's Christ in the center. Moses holding the tablets. And Elijah, black, black. I'm showing you these Greek Orthodox people, how they have paint brushes and their job is to paint over all the black images of Christ, the apostles and all the leaders of Russia. Look, here's Christ black in the background. Let's see what this guy's doing. Let's pull back. Look, they're painting white images or painting over black images, whitewashing them as they call it. It's called iconoclasm. Look in the background here, black image of a Russian leader. They hide all his history. They all work together. They all work together. That's Christ, black. Look, painted over all the black images, made them white. That's why uh, they say critical race theory is dangerous in schools. They don't want the Israelites to enter the school system and bring this out. Look at this. I'm going to zoom in right there. That's Mary and that's baby Christ. Well, if that's the baby Christ black, then who in the hell is this? Who in the hell is this? That's the Antichrist, the 666. Caesar Borgias. All these black images in Russia. Lest We Forget by Velma Maya Thomas. The Passage from Africa to Slavery and Emancipation. All right, let's take a look. Hmm, I'm going to start here. Uh, this was before the invasion of the Europeans. Before Africa was theirs, she belonged to the black man. It was not until the 15th century 
when European powers entered Africa first for gold, then for slaves, that the face of Africa changed. Now, many books discuss the 15th century, which is in the 1400s. What actually occurred in this era? Well, let's take a look. I've got a book here entitled Critical Reviews. The Critical Review or Annals of Literature by a Society of Gentlemen. All righty, then. This was published in, uh, I believe that's 1783. Or was that 1883? <laughs> Let's go inside the page. 140. All right, I'm on page 140. Let's start here. Pope Nicholas V and that famous bull. When it talks about bull, it's talking about a papal bull or papal bull, which was a edict, which was above the king. Pope Nicholas V and that famous bull by which he granted the unknown world to the Portuguese and Spaniards expressly permitted and ordered the Christians to reduce all infidels into slavery. This was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Let me say it again. This was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. The Christian church orchestrated the slave trade. Okay, it was Pope Nicholas V. All right, let's go down. Professor Sprengel divides the history of the Negro trade carried on by Christians. Wait, wait, wait. The slave trade was carried on by who? Christians into two principal periods. The first from 1443 to 1645 and the second from 1645 to the present day, present times. The first period is the time of its increase during which not only as founders, the Portuguese, but the English, the Dutch, and the French dealt in Negro slaves, though chiefly for the use and consumption of the Spaniards and the sugar and tobacco plantations in the Brazils. During the latter period, these four nations were obliged to share that trade with the Swedes. Okay, now you see the Dutch there. I showed you the clip or well, I'm going to show it to you, whichever, in that movie called Them, how the Dutch was in America and did the cruelest things to us. These are all Christians, mind you. All right, let's move over. Mm, I'll start, I'm going to jump over to here. Pay attention. King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas. That's Africa. St. Thomas is Africa. Island of St. Thomas is on the west coast of Africa, which had been discovered in 1471 and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. So the Jews, which were black, was kicked out of Spain and Portugal and sent to Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called, and the Jews in Luango, that's Africa, who are despised even by the very Negroes are descended. So they were, we all descended of one black race, okay? But one group of us were called the Jews and we kept the commandments and the rest of us did not keep the commandments. Okay. So now let's go back here. Uh, before Africa was theirs, she belonged to the black man. It was not until the 15th century, that's the 1400s, when European powers entered Africa first for gold, 
then for slaves, that the face of Africa changed. Let's take a look. This was how Africa looked in the 1400s. Then later on, the face of Africa changed to this. The changing face of Africa, the Africa before the slave trade and Europe's colonial invasion looked quite different than the Africa of today. Let's look at that again. This is how it used to look. This is what it looks like today. Okay. This map of Africa circa 1450 shows some of the indigenous groups and original nation state boundaries. The Africa of the 20th century reflects the European, reflects European boundaries drawn in the 1800s during Europe's partition of and scramble for Africa. You can Google scramble for Africa. They'll show you all the European nations that were in attendance and who wanted what, how Africa was divided up amongst Edomites. They all took a part. Mm. The price of a man. These were the Arabs in Mecca. All right. Horrors of the Middle Passage. This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, about your sons and daughters, about the, uh, our people going into slavery on ships. We shall go into Egypt again with ships. Deuteronomy 28, 64. Here is a slave ship. Let's open it up. You see the bodies of men and women on this ship. This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. All right. Auction again, that's Deuteronomy 2868. You can see in the background a man, woman, and child being sold. Cash for Negroes. This is all Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 through 68. But there was something I saw, I want y'all to look at it. This is it. To make a slave. How does one become a slave? What is the process that turns a human being into a creature of self-hatred and self-doubt? Someone fully controlled and in fearful awe of another? Slaveholders developed a system. It was called seasoning. You ever hear these uh, Christians talk about this is your season? <laughs> you dumb black Christians. It was called, I'm here, seasoning. It was a process under which strong men and women were broken, stripped of their dignity and tortured. Seasoning was a brutal system, a system that remade men in an image pleasing to their oppressor. I want you to see that. It made us in the image pleasing to their oppressor. It rewarded good behavior and punished bad behavior. It turned captive men into things, 
their captives into beasts. The wise slave master never took seriously the belief that my people were natural born slaves. He knew that African men and women fresh from the continent had to be broken in, forced to accept a subservient position. Slaves could never be trusted fully. Men wanted to be free. If slavery were to work, if strong men and succeeding generations were to wear the yoke of bondage, Deuteronomy 28, 48, their psychology would have to be altered. Let's read that part again. Let's zoom in right there. I want y'all to see it. Their psychology would have to be altered. That means changed. Our state of mind would have to be changed. They would have to be made to believe that they were innately inferior and accept slavery as their natural condition. The seasoning process was neither quick nor easy. It took months, years, generations to break my people's spirit. Slaveholders knew the process was essential. Without it, the slaveholding regime would fall. The seasoning began shortly after the arrival of a new shipload of enslaved Africans. Most planters selected trusted slaves those who had already been successfully conditioned to train the new arrivals. Seasoned slaves taught, let's go up, taught, okay, seasoned slaves taught the novices the rudiments, uh, uh, the rudiments of plantation life and how to survive in the cruel new world. They taught them to communicate to use the tools to greet white men with lowered eyes. They taught them their new names, Wilsons, Dewberries, Rays, Dobson, Young, Washingtons, Franklins. They taught them their new names and made sure they understood the new culture and its values. They soothed new arrivals, shielded them as best they could from violent overseers, and tried to explain how they would never again be free, never again return to the country of their birth. They convinced the novices, the beginners, that compliance was in their best interest, that rebellion would result in death. New arrivals were not the only ones to undergo this conditioning, each generation underwent a series of psychological and physical tortures to make them stand in fear. You can't make this stuff up. Here's an example. This is why people accept white Christianity or white supremacy, excuse me, so wholeheartedly. And they fight against the Israelites who try to free their mind, their spirit from the yoke of bondage. Black men and black women have become their own worst enemies today, fighting against the truth that God is black, Christ is black, the angels are black, and that's right, the 12 tribes of Israel are black. And we went into slavery because according to Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 through 68, we broke the commandments of God and were made to suffer a life of bondage and oppression and slavery. So this part here is, is good as well, breaking us from within, breaking our minds. And they have done an excellent job and continue to do so to this very day. All right, all right, all right. Now you saw it for yourself. I pray you learned something from that. So now we're going to get into Bishop Destry Bell and his group of confused black pastors. Now, there's always a ruckus about the Israelites. What to do about the Israelites? They're doing this, they're doing that. Watch and listen to what uh, Bishop Bell and his gaggle of pastors has to say. All right, I'll be right back with my commentary. Asking a simple question, and that is, why do young men appear to be drawn uh, to other religions, religious movements like the Hebrew Israelites? Um, and and so on and so forth. What can be done 
um, in your estimation or in your opinions that can draw young men, African-American men in particularly, to Christ? Um, El Man, can you ask answer that question and then anyone else that want to chime in, you can you can come right on in and we'll just go right along you know, on and on. Ella Man, would you give some uh, understanding to perhaps what your understanding that you're seeing as relates to, relating to why uh, so many young men, African American men particularly, being drawn to other religions like uh, sure. the Israelites, like the Nation of Islam, <clears throat> so talk about it. Sure. God bless you. Thank you all so much, Bishop Hankerson, uh, Bishop Bell. Thank you so much for this opportunity and to all these other great men of God um, that we share this, this time with. Um, that is an amazing question. And, you know, I believe um, as we, we look to move forward in the church, I think that's the very thing that is hindering us because the church itself comes off as a stagnant entity. Um, and so I believe that that the church must get back to being a movement. Um, I just don't believe that nowadays that people want to join a church in the typical fashion that is, uh, you know, in the, in the older way, but they want to get involved with the movement. It's not just the Hebrew Israelite movement. It's all these movements, the, the Me Too movement, the LGBT movement, all of these things are getting, gathering people is because it is a movement and the church itself it comes off as a stagnant entity. Um, and so we have to be uh, a, a part of something and present a movement that is impacting families, impacting lives, impacting uh, uh, things that are affecting our community, affecting um, our generation, and then introducing um, the love of Christ through the movement. It's, it, you know, we're, if you look at Jesus, Jesus was a movement. He wasn't a stand, he wasn't a standalone entity um, when he was moving forward. And, and I'll say one more thing and, and I'll open it up. Um, I believe this is important that the church itself, I believe we have to um, be active and, and be public about our ability to foster and train and develop um, and show future leadership um, and, and give opportunity um, um, for that as we move forward. People want to be a part of, of what they feel like they can make a tangible um, impact in. And so I believe again, if we can we can get back to the church, you know, becoming a movement. I know, you know, I'm not an advocate of preaching. Oh, we got to get outside of the four walls of the church. That that's a given. <clears throat> All right, you heard it for yourself. You heard it for yourself. That was Bishop Destry Bell and seven other confused black pastors. Now that's not the only meeting that I have either seen or read about especially amongst uh, the Kojic uh, church group and the apologetics and various other church organizations all want to know what can be done regarding the Israelites. Now, he put this group, put a little spin. They said, what can we do to draw in young men uh, like the Israelites are doing? And he also, they also tried to throw in Black Lives Matter, LGBT, and the nation is... No, no, no. Listen, Black Lives Matter, LGBT, those things come out once in a while. Okay, well, actually, LGBT, ain't no, black people ain't really running behind that thing too much. You know, the ones that... Yeah, let me just be quiet on that. They get on my... God! Nerves. <laughs> well, listen. Bishop Bell... Bishop Destry Bell asked, why do young men appear to be drawn to the, to the Israelites? What can be done to draw the young men to Christ? As if Christ is not taught amongst the Israelites. Christ is taught amongst the Israelites. What's not taught, Bishop Destry Bell, and this is where you all make your mistake. White supremacy, Jesus, is not taught amongst the Israelites. All that garbage y'all talk about uh, white Jesus coming to see. This is why people are leaving the church. Only dumb black women is filling the church now, primarily, and a few effeminate black men. All right, that's what that's what you need to f acknowledge. Okay, he said, um, the church today is stagnant, and it is. It's been stagnant from for a long time since the civil rights movement. It, it's been stagnant. Um, during the time you have 
I'll put it, I'll word it like this. You brothers and sisters in the Christian church, you have disregarded your such forefathers as Marcus Garvey, uh, Martin Luther King, even Malcolm X. I dare say, yes, Malcolm X. That revolutionary mindset, you guys don't have it. Okay, and remember, and I'll, I'll put Martin Luther King in that, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in that statement because near the end, he realized, he said he feared he had integrated his people into a burning house. See, that's the Martin Luther King you guys don't want to talk about. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. You want the I have a dream guy. The dude that walks around getting beat up all day. That's that's what you want to talk about. You don't have the guts to even that. You don't have the guts to do what he did. Neither do you neither do you have the tes testicular fortitude to realize you've made a mistake and change and amend your ways. Like when Mark Martin Luther King was going to join with Malcolm X and get somewhat more militant. You don't want that Martin Luther King Jr. Nope, you don't want him. So let's get back to the point. Yes, the church today is stagnant. You have no te te testicular fortitude, excuse me. You lack testicular fortitude, my man, all of you. You want to hide in your four walls. You want to make your money. You want to talk about white Jesus and what fills your church? Masculine women and effeminate men. That's right. I said it. Masculine black women and effeminate black men. That's what fills your church. You fail to deal with why we suffer as a people, our hidden identity and responsibility as a people. Let me say it again. This is what you all fail to do. Listen good, uh, Bishop Destry Bell. As church, so-called church leaders, you fail to deal with why we suffer as a people. Biblically, you don't go into the Bible to explain nothing. Neither do you deal with our hidden identity. You know our nationalities were changed. Well, who, who are we according to God? You don't want to deal with that. Mm -mm. And you fail to deal with the responsibility as a people that we have. So I know I did, I, I did, I did some talking like you churches do, but let's go to the scriptures now. Let's go to the word of God. Let's go to the book of Lamentations Chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's start there, shall we? It reads, Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. Let's read that again and let's go through it slow. Thy prophets... The word prophet is synonymous for the word preacher, because when you say you are a preacher, the word preacher breaks down to foretell. To foretell means you are prophesying. So this is talking about you, brothers. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. I'll give you an example. White Jesus is vain and foolish. That's what you see for the people. People go in. I came out of those churches. Walk in. You got white Jesus on some of your stained glass, stained glass windows. You got uh, white Jesus on a cross. You got uh, white Jesus, blonde hair, blue eyes uh, in your pamphlets. And don't dare lie and say you don't do that. Because when we ask your children, we'll go. I remember we had a Brooklyn camp that would stand outside your churches, many of your churches, and would ask the people, especially the kids, who is this? And hold up an image of a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes. And the children would all say, Jesus, that's Jesus. So don't none of you dare fix your lips to lie. Okay. Now, I'm going to get to that in a moment about the color of Christ. Let's read verse 14 again. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. They have not, and they have not discovered thine iniquity. So you don't teach God's commandments. So you have not discovered the iniquity of the people. OK, you got this woman thou art loose mentality that you got from lying Bishop T.D. Jakes. OK, these women disrespect their husbands, commit adultery, 
uh, exalt the pastor over the husband. And you don't correct near one of them. They come in there for healing. You don't tell them the reason you sick. You got high blood pressure. Uh, you got, um, what's that? Diabetes, so forth and so on. Is because of your bad diet, breaking God's dietary law. You don't, nope, you don't do that. Okay. That's just an example. I'm going to read on. To turn away thy captivity. So you never say the reason we went into captivity is because we've broken commandment after commandment after commandment. You don't do that. You won't do that. You black preachers. But have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. You know what banishment means to be cast out and not allowed to enter. What have we been cast out from and no longer are allowed to enter? The promised land, the new Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what it means. But I've seen for the false burdens and causes of banishment. Let's explain the false burdens. Christmas is a false burden. It's not biblical. Why is it a burden? Every year, your members, your congregants spend their money on lying false Christmas presents and go broke and put their tithes in the offering uh, uh, plate that you passed around five times and you get wealthier and wealthier. Mother's Day, okay, is a false burden. We got to go buy flowers for mama, okay? We got to go buy a new suit, new hat, new skirt, okay? That's a burden. Thanksgiving, Valentine's Day, baby day, dog day, cat day, daggone it. New Year's Eve. All these things that I've named are false burdens, Gathering on Sunday is another false burden because there's no biblical evidence that Christ said uh, Sunday has replaced the seventh day Sabbath. So let's read that bottom part again. But have seen for the false burdens and causes of banishment. By you having us celebrate all those false burdens, we're banished from New Jerusalem. We're banished from the promised land to come. Okay. Now I mentioned something earlier. I said... White Jesus, and you don't talk about what Christ looked like. See, black men need someone to... You You all know about gangs, how young black men raised by single black mothers with big mouths. These young black men leave the house and look for that uh, masculine identity to look up to. Y'all have not given that to them. Okay? The Bible describes Jesus Christ. And I, before you fix your black lips to say color doesn't matter, if color doesn't matter, why do you got white Jesus on the cross? Why do you got white Jesus in the church? Why do you got white Jesus in your head? Hmm? So shut your black lips up and just listen. Revelation chapter one describes Christ. Revelation chapter one, verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. See, wool is a texture. There are two textures of hair. You got wool afro hair or thin straight hair. That's what the world consists of. That's what the world consists of. So Christ had wool afro hair. Do you teach that? No, because the black women in your church all perm their hair because they despise the way they look. They get their Brazilian uh, hair weave or the Brazilian, what is it called? Brazilian... Uh, the Brazilian perm. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Okay, to straighten her. Straighten that hair. Get the kinks out of that hair. Get the wool. Wool, thou be gone. That's what you do. And that's because of you black preachers. Why did Michael Jackson look the way he looked? He grew up a Jehovah Witness. He wanted to be like Jesus. Hated the way he looked. Bleached his skin. Alleged to have vitiligo. Changed the shape of his nose. Straightened his hair permanently or sewed a weave into his scalp. That's what I believe he did. Okay, black women do the same thing. All up in the church with blonde hair, blue eye contacts. And none of you black preachers fix your mouth to correct them. So people leave. The men leave first. Let's read on. Revelation 114. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, fully white. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. When you read Genesis 49, 12, Moses said his eyes shall be red with wine. 
He was referring to the Messiah who would come from the tribe of Judah. Okay, that's what he was talking about. That's what he was saying. So that's something that you ministers have neglected. Now, let's look at Genesis. Let me look at it. Make sure I gave you all the right scripture. Genesis 49, verse 12. Yep. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So remember, Christ's first miracle was he turned water into wine. All right. So back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass. Brass is brown. All right. What, what shade of brown? As if they burned in a furnace. So Christ was so dark. So dark, so black a man, he looked like he was burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had a loud oratory voice. Okay. Is that the only place that Christ is described? No, 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 no. Not at all. When you go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Watch this. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz, verse 6. His body also was like the barrel. Barrel is green. He had a green garment. And his face as the appearance of lightning. He had a glow on his face, similar to as when Moses came down the mountain after he got God's law. His face glowed. Okay. It says, and his eyes as lamps of fire. That goes back to Genesis 49, 12 as well. His eyes shall be red with wine. And his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. Polished brass means brass burned in a furnace. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. See, you've not taught the biblical truths at all. You've taught lies about a white savior. Then when the Israelites correct your black behind, you say, color don't matter, brother. Really, if it didn't matter, then why is it in the Bible? Or doesn't the Bible matter? This is why you're losing members. And you will continue to lose members. You won't, the only choice you got is like the Pharisees had. Run to Rome and have Rome arrest and put us to death. That's all you black ministers can do. Because you're the no go. Run to the gates of the nobles. Okay? Let's get some more now. Let's go to Matthew 5 and verse 17. What did Christ teach? Because that had a big thing to do with Christ's movement. White people were drawn to him. Matthew chapter 5, because he tells you what to teach here. Verse 17, Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. So let's, and let's discuss that. Christ did not come to destroy the law or anything that the prophets prophesied. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You have taught that Christ fulfilled all the law so you don't have to deal with it no more. This is a part of why you're losing membership. Because men and women who come from church, like myself, when I used to go to the abominable chapels and churches, I come from church after a feel-good sermon, and I see drug dealers, drug addicts. I see dead bodies here and there. I hear shootings. I see shootings. People shot in the head, stabbed. Okay. I see adultery being committed. Okay. And you're going, you're giving me a feel good religion. I see problems. I turn to the left. I see evil. I turn to the right. More evil. I turn behind me. More evil. Evil to the left of me. Evil to the right. Evil behind me. Evil in front of me. And you telling me about some love of Jesus. So when we go back. To Matthew 5, 17, Christ said again, let's explain it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What did Christ come to fulfill? Let's go with me to Acts 3, 18, please. Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. Mm -hmm. All right. It reads... But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. So what did he fulfill? Sacrifice. His sacrifice. The law of sacrifice. 
he fulfilled the law of sacrifice because he became a sacrifice for the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's go on back to Matthew 5, 17 again. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He fulfilled the law of sacrifice. Remember, the scholars have broken the law down into five categories. You had sacrificial law, moral law, dietary law, civil law, and ceremonial law. Those are five categories. Out of those five categories, which one did he fulfill? The law of sacrifice. So that means we must still keep the moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, dietary law. Those laws are still in effect. Okay. Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Has everything been fulfilled yet? No, because we still here in America, oppressed. So everything's not fulfilled. Let's read on. Verse 19. Where, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That means you ain't going to make it. But whosoever shall do and teach them. Do and teach what? It's explaining the commandments. He's telling you what to do and teach, ministers. Bishop Destry Bell, Christ, the Son of God, is commanding you to do and teach the commandments. Now, if you believe the Bible, you're going to do what he said. But if you don't, you're going to stick with your feel-good religion. You're going to keep teaching traditions of men and your lying false holidays. Okay, verse 19 again. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's the 144, yo. 144, yo. 144,000. All right. Now, let's move on from there. Let's go to Matthew 1. I'm going to stick with Matthew just a little bit. Matthew chapter 1, verse... 17. I want y'all to pay close attention to this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away unto Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Hmm. Hmm. We're going to come back to that in a minute. I'm going to jump down to verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You know what his people means? It's possessive. Okay, his is possessive. Like if I said those are his shoes. His shoes don't mean everybody's shoes. If I say that is his wallet. His wallet don't mean everybody's wallet. Likewise, when it says his people don't mean every people on the planet Earth. Who is Christ's people? Because he came from the tribe of Judah. He was of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Judah. You can read that in Hebrews 7, 14. Hell, this first chapter, Matthew chapter 1, is telling you that right there. Okay. But the qu next question is when it says, for he shall save his people from their sins. What is sin? Pastors. Bishops, what is sin? Let's go to 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Wow. So sin is when you break God's law. What happens when you break God's law? Hmm. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Watch this. I, I need, I'm building, I'm building. Okay, I know y'all you, might have thought I forgot the point. I didn't forget the point. Deuteronomy 28, 15. Watch what, what the Lord told Moses to say to the 12 tribes of Israel. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. 
Now, for time's sake, I'm just going to read one curse. Verse 32. Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. What does it mean, thy sons and your daughters shall be given to another people? Slavery, captivity, oppression. Hmm? So let's go back to Matthew 121 now. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So a result of sin, breaking God's commandments, is slavery, captivity, oppression. Were the children of Israel in Matthew chapter 1 in captivity or being oppressed? Let's jump back up to verse 17. See, I know you, you were curious why I went to verse 17. Let's read it. Again, Matthew 1, 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. Oh, and by the way, you can read about the 14 generations each in verse 1 through 16. It breaks it down for you. Do it on your own time. Verse 17 again. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. So I want to I want to pause there from David to the carrying away into Babylon of 14 generations. So within those 14 generations, what happened to the 12 tribes of Israel? What well, a northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity under the Assyrian captivity, the Assyrian Empire. Then the southern kingdom of Israel went into the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Okay, so let's look at that again. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon of 14 generations. So the 12 tribes of Israel went into captivity. Watch this. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ of 14 generations. What happened after Babylon? You had the Persian Mede captivity. Cyrus allowed the Israelites to return back. Everybody did not come back. Some came back to the land. That's why we always tell you when Christ was on a scene, all 12 tribes of Israel were not there. Okay, what happened after the Persian Mede captivity? The Greek captivity transpired. You can read about that in the book of Maccabees or Daniel 11 or Daniel uh, 8. Okay, so what happened after the Greek captivity? Rome, Rome, the Roman captivity. This is what you're reading about here. Rome had already subdued Israel, collected, was collecting taxes and all that. They didn't destroy them yet, but Rome was oppressing the, the Israelites that were there, present. So, after you read verse 17 and then jump down to verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Why? Because they were under Roman captivity. That's why. Roman captivity. Rome was in power here. Okay? I hope you understand that. Now, let's look at Matthew 15, 24. Who did Christ run around teaching? What do people think Christ ran around teaching everybody? Y'all are simple. Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, that's the same thing the angel told Mary. Thou shalt bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people. His people. Christ is an adult here in Matthew 15, 24. He says, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you pastors, you despise that because you've been taught lies in your theology schools. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about when he died and resurrected? Maybe it changed. Go to Matthew 28. Let's go to Matthew 28, please, verse 19. This is after the resurrection. That's what Christ said to the disciples. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Oh, see, right there, and teach all nations. You think you got me there. What was the prophecy in Deuteronomy? As a result of breaking God's commandments. Let's, let's take a look. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 28. Let's go on back. 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. Here's a curse. And the Lord, Deuteronomy 28, 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease. So the Israelites were scattered among the nations. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 4.27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. Ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. So when Christ said in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Christ knew the prophecy that the Israelites were scattered among all nations. It's only you lying preachers of today. You're too high-minded and prideful to accept that. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Hebrews 5 and 12. Watch this. Let me tell you what you preachers got to do. If you, want, if you want deliverance, you want salvation. You got to make your decision. What is, what's more important to you? Money or salvation? Matthew 5, 12. For when the time you ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So y'all need to be taught again, just like Nicodemus. Okay? When you read our John chapter 3, he came to Christ by night. Y'all could come to us by night. We'll guide you. We'll show you the scriptures, what they mean. And you could teach your congregations. Now, we're not saying everybody in your congregation is going to stay because we know a lot of them in your congregation hate the word of God, the unadulterated word of God. They despise it and they're going to leave. OK, just be aware of that. OK, so let's get ready for the reading of the shout out letters, shall we? Ezra chapter 5 verse 73 and by their secret plot right so their secret plots is their whole agenda that they have anything that they move forward in the earth it's always with the Israelites at the forefront of their mind because they know that when we come together when our boys become men when that elect number is sealed it's game over for them right. so they have thousands of secret plots that they try to employ against us to keep us down and one of the main ones that we're, be, we're going to be dealing with as we continue on with this series is the effeminization of our men, or like I brought out in last week's show, the pussification of our men and our boys. All right, let's get to the shout out letters. I want to give a shout out to Chiron M. I want to thank you for the brick. <laughs> That's what you called it, the brick. All praises to the Lord. I want to give a shout out to P. Powell. This letter reads, may the most high in Christ bless you, Bishop Nathaniel. You are a good man. Well, there's none good but one. That's the Lord. <laughs> God has chosen you to go throughout the whole world to teach the gospel. I'm a brother from one West in Harlem. Wow. That is where I was first introduced to Christ, and I never forgot the truth. P.S. If Christ is for his people, then who can be against his people? All praises, people. All praises. Uh, very few souls that um, survived the days of the original One West. Not this One West people you got running around today, but the original One West crew. All praise to the Lord. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. All right. The next one is a letter. Uh, it reads, Hi, Bishop. My name is Moshe. 
I'm 11 years old and I've been in the truth for seven years. All praises. How long have you been in the truth? 30. Dad, he wrote my guess is 40 years. No, 30, 31 years, 31. You are the best that happened to me. I've received more wisdom from IUIC than in school. You're doing a great thing for our people. You're like Paul in Christ. You will die for our people. I remember you got arrested in Cuba. Most people wouldn't dare risk going to jail to preach the gospel. I always wanted to meet you in Deacons. I've already met Deacon Malachiya at IUIC Virginia. Shout out to Deacon Malachiya. Lord's willing, I can meet the rest of the Deacons one day. Maybe one day we could all go over scriptures. I remember the time Deacon Malachiya gave me a compliment on my lion chain. My chin dropped because it was so cool to have met him and to have a deacon compliment my Judah drip. <laughs> I've always wanted to write you a letter. Now I get to do it. Your friend Moshe. P.S. When will Captain Isaac become a deacon? <laughs> we'll see. We will see Lord's will. Soon, I hope. This is my donation. Hope it helps. All praises. Thank you, Moshe. All pra you know Captain Isaac has a son named Moshe. All praises to the Lord. All right. This next letter reads, Shalom, Bishop. Last time I wrote to you, I just said thank you. What I meant by that was thank you for seeking out the truth. I get so emotional every time I think about my journey in this life. I always knew we are a special people. I just didn't know how. It's hard writing this letter, so I will make it quick. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Thank you for the answer. Uh, if it's not too much to ask, please pray for... Okay. You know what? Let me look at Genesis 1, 26, 20. Let me see what... Let me see. You know, I know it's the creation, but I don't remember exactly. All right. Genesis 1, 26 to 28 deals with the creation of man and be fruitful and multiply. Now, you asked for a prayer. You gave a list of names here. Okay. I won't read the names on the air like you ask. It says strength, guidance, patience, wisdom, understanding, endurance, and being set free in this Babylonian mess. Okay, definitely we will do that. Make sure, let's make sure they all have willing spirits. Again, thank you, uh, J C L B is your initials. J C L B. Okay, uh, P.S. Please accept this donation towards building and waking up the tribes in Africa. On behalf of my Lord and I, we say, Shalom, Most High in Christ, bless all praises. Thank you so much. J, is that JC? JC, okay. The next one is a pretty card of an island with beautiful blue water. And it reads, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Greetings, Bishop Nathaniel. I'm writing out, I'm reaching out from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ah, that's why that front of the card is so lovely. I just want to thank you and all the brothers on the front line bringing out this truth. I always knew something was wrong, and, and now I know why. When will IUIC come and release our brothers and sisters from captivity in the U.S. Virgin Islands? That's St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. Now, we've been to St. Thomas several times. I believe we went to St. John, and I do think we went to St. Croix, but I'm not 100% on St. Croix. St. Thomas, I'm 100% because I was there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do, um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send this to Deacon Malachi because I put him over the international travels for this year. All right. It reads on. I'm so grateful that the Most High is healing you. My son, Lucius, is at the Atlanta camp. All praises. I will be joining him for the Feast of Dedication. Wait a minute. What date was the Feast of Dedication? All right. That was like... Uh, or some time ago now. See, I'm getting the letters all late. Next week, Lord's willing. Okay, here's my arms and a token of our appreciation. Looking forward to visit and learn and grow in the knowledge and wisdom of the Most High. I hope I get a chance to meet leadership when I visit. But most 
of just being there is an honor and privilege. All praises to the Most High God, Most High in Christ, bless you all. Much love. Lucius and Abaya. Abaya is the mom, Lucius is the son. And I see you got your phone number and email, so I'll have Deacon Asaph reach out to you. All right, all praises. Let's put that right there. All right. This next letter says, Bishop, please use this as needed. Where needed. Please keep me and my family in prayer. We are newbies to IOIC. Most high in Christ bless. Gwendolyn H. All praises. Thank you, Gwendolyn. All right. This next letter reads, Hi, Bishop. Old Jesse from Arkansas again. I hope all is well with your family, IOIC. I watch y'all daily on YouTube because of y'all. I now know I am an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. That's right. All praises. That's right. I was raised in Mississippi uh, and Arkansas. I wish there was a camp close to where I live. I get sleepy too much when I have to drive long distance. Revelation 114, 39, 313, 39, 1310. I hope I'll be ready when Christ comes. I'm trying to keep the commandments that I have learned. But I know it's Mm, I know it's, is that L15? Mm, L-15, I don't know what that means. Okay, let me read on. I am trying to get my house in order with my black fiancé, Lord help me. <laughs> now you wrote black fiancé. <laughs> so, mm, that can be in. Uh, taken a few ways, but I'll leave it. I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna read it again in case I misread it. I'm trying to get my house in order with my black fiance. Lord help me. Smiley face. She lost her mom last year. She's the baby of 13. Her dad is 88 years old. My dad and mom been gone. I wish they had learned about this truth. I hope you understand my writing. I hope. I see you have problems with some people's writing. That's right. Smile. For the cause, Jesse and Laquita. All praise to Jesse and Laquita. Thank y'all so, so much. Oh, Lord have mercy. I got through it. I got through it. All right. The next one is a letter. It's from Brother Rob G. of Allendale, South Carolina. Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel, leadership and family. All praises to the Most High, the Holy One of Israel. I would like to thank the men of IUIC in, in Israel, not in Christ, bless mm, for coming out to my community, hometown of Allendale. Uh, man, and I'm sorry I missed the great men of God when they came through my hometown community in Allendale on Patterson Street. Myself and my wife was inside our home doing our Sabbath. Give the Most High all the praises. I hope to catch the great men of God on their next visit to my hometown community of Allendale. Bishop Nathaniel, I saw the video with my wife on Facebook. The IUIC men of Israel United in Christ did a wonderful job. All praises to the Most High. I would like to send another donation to the men of IUIC Christ. Bless Brother Rob G. of Allendale. Uh, Bishop Nathaniel, my people didn't never seen great men of power of God. They were shocked when them when the men of God came through. All praises, put them scriptures in their ear. All praises, that was it. Thank you, Rob G. Thank you, Brother Rob G. All right. This next one is from P. Powell. P. Powell. God bless you, Bishop Nathaniel. This is an extremely turbulent time. For the nation of Israel, and I thank God that we have strong leaders like yourself to help raise up the nation of Israel. I think that uh, your shout out Tuesday segments are great for the public. I noticed that you are the kind of man that hate corruption because I see how you bust out these false preachers trying to <laughs> teach the word of God to the nation of Israel. They were not sent by God. You are the one. P.S. Most High in Christ, bless you, Bishop Nathaniel. All praise. Thank you, P. Powell. 
Thank you so, so much. All praises. The next letter reads, Shalom Leadership. Thanks for the hard work. I pray that the Lord continue to strengthen you and continue the hard work. Thanks be to the Most High. Let the Almighty keep you safe. Sister Patricia. Thank you, Sister Patricia. Thank you. All right. The next letter reads, Shalom to our beloved Bishop Nathaniel. Thank you for walking in obedience to the Most High going to the four corners of the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have set the example that all Israel should follow. Our prayer is that you and your house continue in the faith of Christ and endure the trials. We love you, Bishop. All praises, this is from Isaac and Rebecca. Thank you, Isaac and Rebecca. All praises to the Lord. All right. All right, let's get to the shout-out donations. I want to give a shout-out to P. Powell, uh, Kenneth S S, Kenneth S, Brinkley S, J and Latoya B, all praises. Uh, Claudesta L R of Tennessee, all praises. Charles and Mina N of Tacoma, Washington, all praises. Shirley B J, um, all praises. Thank you so much. Philip T, thank you so much. Abaya of the U.S. Virgin Isles. Thank you so much. Abaya again. Thank you. Oh, Abaya again. All praises. And Abaya again. All praises. And Abaya again. All praises. Abaya again. <laughs> All praises. And Abaya again. Abaya again. And Abaya again. All praises. Abaya much blessings to you and everyone that has donated. All praises. Thank you so much. I want to give a shout out to Gwendolyn H. All praises. Thank you, Gwendolyn uh, of Kansas. All praises. Shout out to Joyce A. H. Okay, of Gainesville, Florida. Thank you. Shout out to Deborah M. of Pensacola. Shout out to Jesse and Laquita. All praises. Shout out to Shirley, mm, Shirley, I'll tell you the handwriting on that last name, Shirley A, I think that's W, well, oh, praises, thank you, Shirley, and thank you again, Shirley, thank you, or oh, shout out to Sheila K and Jada R, all praises, all praises, shout out to uh, Isaac and Rebecca, all praises. Shout out to Sandra R, all praises. Shout out to Patricia G. All right, and that is that. Mm. All praises. <laughs> Shout out to, and this one I can't read. Wow. You are from New, New York, New York. All praises to you. Thank you. Shout out to Charles L. Shout out to David H. And last but not least, shout out to Moshe. All praises. All pra That's the 11-year-old. All praises. Thank you all so, so much. You all know how I love to say, let's all of us please stay healthy. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay focused. But most of all, let's all of us stay in the spirit. Most high in Christ bless you all. Love you. Shalom. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold, from Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone, 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.